Inicinus Academic, uh, sorry, the coordinator for the ProBrow project in Germany, Professor Dr. Jürgen Hovold, who is also Director of Social Research Center at TU Dortmund University and Professor at the Faculty of Economics. The coordinator for the ProBrow project in Brazil, also Dean of Unicinus Business School, Professor Dr. Claudia Cristina Bittencourt. Unicinus Director of Graduate Studies and Research, Professor Dr. Dorothea Frank Kirsch. Did I say it right? Kirsch. Now, I'd like to give the floor to Professor Claudia Cristina Bittencourt and Professor Dr. Jürgen Hovold, coordinator for the ProBrow project in Brazil and Germany. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Nicinos. It's a pleasure to have all you here this morning. Um, when Professor Hovold and I started organizing this event, we didn't imagine how many people would be interested about discussing social innovation. So we are very happy that to have all you here today. Uh, our seminar um, actually has a, a, a support by CAPS and DAD because our seminar is a result of a partnership that started two years ago with a collaborative project. So I would like to thank you, DAD, with Robert, present here, and uh, also CAPES. I also want to uh, thank you all our students, especially the one who is working as a volunteer this morning, so thank you. <laughs> and of course, our speakers. Without you, this seminar will not po be possible. So please, feel uh, yourself at home, and uh, you are going to start our first panel soon. But uh, first, I would like to introduce you to our partner, Professor Jürgen Hovold from um, TU Dortmund. Yes, uh, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the TU Dortmund University. Uh, we are really proud to be here in Porto Alegre and to discuss with you about social innovation. Uh, and as Claudia mentioned already, this is uh, uh, organized in the framework of a, a project that we had together for two years, uh, have an exchange of ideas between Unisinos and uh, TU Dortmund University. And the main topic of that uh, pro project was uh, cooperation in social innovation projects because we were convinced that uh, uh, social innovation projects need the cooperation between different partners. A successful social innovation is normally not the result of one person. It was a great idea, but it's uh, the result of cooperation between people from different organizations, different sectors, and different countries also. And I think that is a very important point. But at the same time, cooperation is a tricky and very difficult thing to make. And it needs that we learn and have competences and are able to understand uh, things that other people from companies, from research, think and therefore that was the main topic of our project and we send around uh, PhD students, we organize workshops, uh, we do a lot to learn from each other because I think uh, mutual learning is a very important point in uh, social innovation initiatives and especially uh, also in the research institutes that uh, try to understand social innovation and therefore we had uh, I would say very fruitful years uh, together. At the last uh, meeting in Dortmund, Claudia and I sat together and said, maybe it is a good idea to broaden the perspective and uh, to, to uh, invite people from other universities here in Brazil to be part of that and also share their uh, ideas and their experience in social innovation. And we invited uh, people from other universities and uh, there was a good response. Thank you for all presenters that are here from, uh, and, and giving their perspective on social innovation. And I think we will have a very exciting discussion today. We will learn a lot uh, about uh, social innovation in different parts uh, of uh, Brazil. And also I will have the time, so I can make it short now, to present the research that we uh, did in Dortmund uh, about the role of universities in social innovation processes. Uh, 
And Dmitry Domanski, my colleague from Dortmund, will also say something about the uh, importance of ecosystems of social innovation. And I think uh, it will be really a very important day, and uh, I'm looking forward to for the discussion. Last word, I would like to thank the organizers from Unisinos, Claudia and uh, her team, that uh, they make that possible, because I know it's always very difficult to have so many interesting people here together. And I would also thank Dmitry Romansky uh, from the TU Dortmund, who also tried to uh, give support and conceptualize this workshop in white people. And so I really thank you uh, for your interest and uh, looking forward to the discussion. And I wish us all a very fruitful day. Now we hand it over to the Unicinus Director of Research and Graduate Studies, Professor Dr. Dorothea Frank Kirsch. Meine liebe Damen und Herren, ich möchte Sie alle recht herzlich begrüßen und willkommen zu heißen. Und ich freue mich, dass es durch die Zusammenarbeit unserer Universitäten dieses Seminar möglich ist. Germany is one of our most important academic partner country. <clears throat> In the scope of print, Probrau, and European Union, we collaborate already with Friedrich Alexander Universität, V. Erlangen, Duisburg, Essen, and obviously TU Dortmund. Social innovation is a very important topic for us, not only for research, but for what we do and what we are as a Jesuit university. I hope you have a great time here, that you can improve our collaboration and your projects. Have a great time here. Thank you. We also invite the president of Unicinus, Professor Dr. Father Marcelo Fernandes de Aquino, to give his address to the audience. Dear friends from German and uh, Brazilian universities, good morning. Thank God we have uh, so nice weather today. And uh, thank God our friends from Germany, you are here among us, and we are working together to be the better world. That's our uh, purpose. Uh, Unicinus this year, we are celebrating 50 years of our foundation. We are really a quite young university, not so old, not so strong as your German tradition. But in one way, we are very proud of our university. As some of you know, we are at uh, the beginning a uh, university, a Brazilian university with uh, quite a strong uh, German roots because uh, we, since the beginning, we were orientated to give uh, intellectual support for a uh, German-Brazilian population in South Brazil. And uh, we are nowadays moving toward uh, a more, much more multicultural uh, university we are doing our best to include more Afro-Brazilian people. And uh, we have a strong commitment with social research. By the way, in the last uh, 15 years, we are trying to be better and better a uh, strong research university. And uh, without losing our social uh, commitment. This is our uh, strategic planning. How should we be a better research, a global research university with a social commitment? Is, I think it's possible 
to work in order to have a social and global uh, world much, much better for poor people. Excellence, academical excellence is uh, the right for poor people too, not for the elites. Uh, I know we are going through a very complex time in Brazil, in our society, in our uh, power, political power. Some of us, we are really shamed by some, uh, uh, some attitude toward the poor people, women. In any way, we are doing our best to be a good research social university. Please, we have a commitment to make a better Brazil. Thank you so much. So, now it's time for our first conference. Research on the relationship between Brazil and Germany, current challenges and future tasks. It's going to be presented by Dr. Robert Schad. I'm not sure if I said it right. Schad. It's okay. Uh, from the German Academic Exchange Service. Finally, uh, I'd just like to remember that each speaker has 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm the representative of the DAAD, uh, which I will present to you uh, in a few seconds already. Um, o Jürgen, uh, ah, agora eu quero falar português, mas preciso falar inglês. Uh, Jürgen uh, already mentioned that there's the connection between Dortmund and Porto Alegre, the Pro Brau um, relationship, right? Which is a project which is um, supported by the DAD and connects two, two important cities with uh, very good uh, football clubs as well, no? Dortmund and Grêmio, of course. Sorry for the interference here. Um, okay, I will uh, give a short overview about uh, the DAD. Uh, here in Brazil. Um, I will talk about what the DAD is, what it means, um, what the DAD, especially here in Brazil, uh, does. Um, then, then I will talk a bit about funding possibilities very rapidly because um, these are things that are listed um, uh, as well on, in the internet. And I will talk about my personal experience here as a lecturer a lecturer as a position that um, is um, supported by the DAD as well, and now uh, it's, it's, a, it's a scholarship. And some people ask me, what does it mean, lecturer, because people are not so used to, to have lecturer. Um, uh, there were already people who uh, mixed it up with electrician, which I'm not. Uh, I would be the worst electrician, probably. Okay. Uh, the German Academic Exchange Service, DAD. DAD is the abbreviation for Deutscher Akademischer Auslandsdienst. In English would be German Academic Exchange Service. And it's a representative of 241 member universities. So there are the, the, the other universities uh, are listed up geographically there. So it's a lot of universities all over Germany. And we represent them being 100 uh, 104 uh, student bodies, um, student bodies, it's not uh, dead students, it's um, uh, Studentenausschuss in German, so representative of students. So the DAD is represented worldwide, as you can see here. Um, for instance, we have the regional office in Rio de Janeiro, so... Um, everybody who wants to travel to Rio de Janeiro can, can have a look at our, um, our base there. Um, we have 57 information centers. Um, we had one in Sao Paulo, which was closed um, recently. And we have uh, a lot of lecturers, like the people that um, do the same as I do. And actually, we have 29 lecturers in Latin America. Right now, we have seven in Brazil. 
so I'm one of the seven. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of lecturers, a lot of information centers in Europe, of course, but also worldwide. Uh, we have 21 lecturers in North America and others on other continents. So we are well represented all over the world. Um, and one part of the, the work that the DRD does is also give, to give scholarship for Germans, but also for foreigners. Uh, for instance, Brazilians, so uh, here you can see some numbers. Uh, it's not the most actual numbers, it's from 2017. But just to give you a, a short impression, um, how many people were funded by the DRD, so 1,380,000 Germans and 974,000 foreigners, um, which include 35,600 Brazilians. So these could be people funded on various um, levels, could be graduation, could be um, post-graduation, PhD. Uh, just to mention the three uh, goals and tasks of the DRD, which is part of the last structural structure paper. The next one will appear in 2021, I guess. So there's three um, slogans, more or less, scholarships for the best. So the thing that we do to uh, support uh, Germans and Brazilians with scholarships. Uh, structures for internationalization. So this is um, to support international internationalization programs on Brazilian universities, German universities, Germ uh, universities worldwide to somehow support uh, academic exchange. Um, this with projects, for instance, um, with scholarships, with visiting professors. And the third part is expertise for academic collaboration. So, um, at, as we could see, for instance, in the ProBrow program, right, um, there um, is a lot that we do about um, to support collaboration between uni two universities, between people. And now these are the three slogans. Um, just to give you a short overview about the history, uh, it's quite interesting as well. Um, 1951, the first scholarships were given to Brazilian students. So the DAD was funded basically in 1925, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And the first scholarships to Brazilian were given, Brazilians were given in 1951. Uh, uh, since 94, there's a joint selection with CAPES as well. In 72, opened the regional office in Rio de Janeiro. Um, so we have, if I can calculate right, almost 50 years of the um, regional office right now. Uh, regional office is in Botafogo, very beautiful. It's a small building, but very uh, nicely situated. Um, then 1985 um, happened the first memorandum of understanding between CAPES and DRD. Um, 1994, the first called ProBrau, uh, also between CAPES and DRD. So also this kind of um, project already has some history of, I think, right now 25 years, right? Then in 2001, opened the information center in Sao Paulo, which, as I said, doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Um, 2001 was um, inaugurated the Martius chair at the USP, so the University of Sao Paulo. Um, the Martius chair uh, was actually, in the beginning, a chair for, for German professors of ecology to come to Brazil to um, to stay some years at the uh, University of Sao Paulo. But um, it was, the last year was more open to other fields as well. I think the, the actual chairholder, she is a, um, she is a scientist in um, politics, if I'm not mistaken. So it was, was open to other fields as well. Um, 2012, um, was the year of the inauguration of the DWIH. I don't know if everybody knows what it means. It's the German House of Science and Innovation in Sao Paulo. 
Um, so it's also a recent thing, but um, they promote a lot um, activities uh, on exchange between German and um, Brazilian universities, but also for for German companies could be interesting for Brazilian companies. So it's um, a very very big uh, enterprise, a very big project. Uh, 2015 um, was initiated as well the memory of understanding between MEC and DAD and after um, the project uh, Science Without Borders, um, Ciencias Sem Fronteras, uh, was initi initiated another smaller project actually which was called Languages Without Borders, um, um, Idiomas Sem Fronteras. So Languages Without Borders is actually a program which, um, which presents uh, language courses, but not language courses with uh, physical people, but what we call blended learning. So it's online German classes, but also other languages, English, Spanish as well. And right now uh, we have 2000, no, 1,500 um, open open places for people who want to learn German for the next four years. So it's a lot, like all over Brazil, um, and like lots of universities all over Brazil are participating, and people can study German online. Of course, it's not the same as to go to Germany, like in the former program, but at least it's something. Okay, 2017 opened the Center of German and European Studies, the CDA in Porto Alegre. Uh, so this is a very important step for all the people here because it's a shared program between Urgis and Puki and Porto Alegre. Um, and it's, um, it's a project, uh, CDA exists in, um, in other parts of the world, so there are 20 of these CDAs all over the world. And the one in Porto Alegre is the first on the southern hemisphere right now, so it's a very, very recent um, program. Uh, unfortunately, Odraiton uh, couldn't be here today. He would talk a bit more on the CDA, but I will present it um, afterwards a bit. And just to give you some more numbers, uh, we have more than 5,000 alumni all over Brazil, uh, 10 local associations, and one network which deals with, um, with the um, with deals with interchange between German universities and Brazilian universities, um, between Brazilians and Germans, which is called Rebra Lynch. It's also a project which, which is very recent, a very recent project. Okay, the idea in Brazil, main work areas, just to sum up, we give information about study and research in Germany. Um, we give scholarships for student and researchers, so there are scholarships, as I said, no, on the level of uh, graduation, until scholarships for people who do a PhD or want to do a PhD in Germany. Um, we support university cooperation with different projects. We uh, try to support mobility in bilateral research projects. We support as well as visiting professors at Brazilian universities, so German professors, uh, for example, want to stay two months or up to half a year on, in Brazilian universities. Um, we try to promote German, Germanistic and related areas, uh, because one part of our, our program is also to promote the German culture, Germanistics, and of course, German language plays a big role because people who want to do uh, interchange programs in Germany, of course, they need to need a bit of German to, to communicate. And we also support the alumni, so people, Brazilians, for example, uh, example who uh, gained a scholarship many years ago, and um, we still support them nowadays. Okay. Then we have the DAD lecturers, as I said, not electricians. Um, I'm one of these seven we have actually in Brazil. So there's one in Belém, one in Belo Horizonte, one in Curitiba, Fortaleza, Porto Alegre, and two in Rio de Janeiro. Um, from March, there will be one more in Sao Paulo. Um, 
actually exist two types of lecturers. One is Regellektorat, so it's a regular lecturer. Um, it's like the normal uh, lecturer who does, or who deals actually with the language, with language classes, with the literature, culture. And another one is the Fachlektorat, because it's a lecturer who is more responsible for a certain area. So there could be a Fachlektorat in, um, in politics, there could be a Fachlektorat in, um, in literature as well. So these are more like focused on one area. Uh, as I said, there exists the Marzius Chair. Um, I already talked about the regional office and the CDA, which I will talk uh, later on as well. All right, now. Okay, CDA Porto Alegre, unfortunately, Odrait and couldn't be here today, but I will try to, to sum, up, sum up what the CDA does. I guess some of the people here already know the CDA. Oh no. Okay. Net CDA, Centro de Estudos Europeos Alemais, or Alemais Europeos. Um, which is a center of German and European studies in Porto Alegre since 2017. So as I said, it's very recent, recently funded here. And it's a joint program by the DAD, the PUKI and the URGIS, the Federal University and the, um, the Catholic University. And it's a center for information study and research, interdisciplinary studies, uh, founded by the DRD, and there are three main topics um, which were introduced in 2017. One is globalization, uh, sustainable development, so one top topic which uh, is also actual, actually important here, and cultural diversity. So for instance, I think next month we have a big congress on migration at the PUKI, so everybody who's interested could have a look on the program online as well. Um, as I said, it's the first center of German European studies on the southern hemisphere. So, worldwide exist 20 of these um, 20 of these um, CDAs, no? centers. Um, and which is important is to to maintain contacts with German partner universities. So, the CDA has um, cooperation between the CDA and University of Heidelberg, Bonn, and Erlangen Nuremberg. And one thing which is very interesting that exists um, at the URGIS right now, a Master in European and German Law. So this is a program which of course uh, also deals with German law and is a comparative studies between Brazilian and German law. So it's important for, for the people there to, to know German, to know about the German cult, um, historical context in law. Okay. Uh, this was the part of the, the CDA. Right now I want to uh, switch to the German House for Research and Innovation, DWIH, ne, in German, Deutsches Haus für Wissenschaft und Innovation, which was también recently inaugurated in 2012. Um, it's coordinated by the DRD and founded by the German Federal Foreign Office. Uh, provides a joint platform for German scientific organizations and research-based companies. And uh, this means ne, German scientific organizations, it's not just universities, but also other scientific organizations like uh, Fraunhofer, um, DFG, Die Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Um, here I listed up just a few supporters. So DRD, DFG, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, FU Berlin, TU München, University Alliance Ruhr, Westfälische Wilhelms Universität Münster, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, GAST, University of Potsdam, and they are also associated supporters. So in this, in this context, there are also like a lot of projects, a lot of workshops between um, Germany and Brazilian institutions, or German and Brazilian institutions. Um, the DRD, as I said, also gives scholarships for people on all kinds of uh, levels, academic levels. Um, just to mention a few, we have uh, some programs like the Winter Language Course for Brazilians, so people who want to spend uh, the nice winter time in Germany. It's a class, um, or it's a course of six weeks uh, for Brazilian students, could be students from graduação, post-graduação, and people who do a PhD. 
Um, so it's open for basically everyone. It's a language class and also a culture class in several German cities. It's quite popular. Right now we do the selection for the next year. And it will open every year for, for people who want to spend six weeks in Germany. So it could be uh, quite an interesting program for students here. Um, if anybody has questions afterwards, I can answer. Um, and we have also uh, scholarships for PhD uh, candidates. Uh, for example, full paid PhD in Germany. We have sandwich. It's a very nice uh, word, sandwich uh, scholarship. So this means that people can stay some part of the PhD in Germany and the other part in Brazil. Um, we have uh, also scholarships for master programs. So one of this is EPOS, Development Related Master. Uh, there's another program actually which is called uh, Helmut Schmidt program, which is a master in um, good governance. Um, the, these are programs in English basically, so it could be interesting as well for people who don't speak so much German. And we have like other possibilities for students to travel to Germany for short research, for short stays. Um, there are scholarship for Germans as well, like the scholarship that I have for being a lecturer here in Porto Alegre. Um, and we have cooperation uh, schemes, like uh, I already mentioned Pro Brau. We have Germanistic or Germanistische Institutspartnerschaft, so it's a partnership between Germanistics uh, in a Br Brazilian university with a uh, German University, for instance, the URGIS has one GIP, ne, one of these partnerships with the University of Erlangen. So there are always people here and people from here who travel to Erlangen. There's also scholarships for students as well every year. Um, and I already mentioned CDA and other de de development partnership and strategic partnerships. Okay, Pro Brau. Ne, um, just a few words about ProBrau. Um, ProBrau is um, responsible for funding of mobility and joint research projects. Um, this program is dedicated to universities and res research institutions, uh, but also open for PhD candidates and masters as well. And it works like this, that two teams, uh, one from Germany, one from Brazil, apply with one project and they work complemented complementary on it. No? Um, it's like the, the cooperation between Unisinos and Dortmund, it's the same project. And we fund, we as the idea, we fund up to 30 projects per year. So um, a lot of projects all over Brazil. Okay, last part will be just a more personal part where, where we'll talk about my, my daily life, more or less. Um, what I do here, just to um, defend myself, what I do, that I do something. Um, so I will uh, just mention the, the most important things that I do. So I'm a visiting prof professor of German language, language and culture at the Federal University Rio Grande do Sul at the URGIS. So my daily work is to give classes, actually, classes in um, language uh, and also literature. Right now I have a course on literature after the Second World War, which is quite interesting. I hope also quite interesting for the, for the students. Um, I did some, some more special courses as well last year, because I'm here just for, like, um, right now, just two semesters, so uh, not so long, not so much time. I gave a class in German for the academic context, which was open for students who think about studying in Germany, who want to do a PhD in Germany, and it was a class in explaining how the, the, the academic structure in Germany works, uh, the daily life uh, being a student at a German university, so more an introductory, introductory course. And last semester I also gave a course on the German Grundgesetz, ne, the basic law in German, because as I said, there's a master's program of comparative uh, law between the uh, German and Brazilian law. Um, and this was quite interesting because the uh, federal law has ber birthday this year, so it was the 70th birthday, so I think it was quite interesting to read actually the German federal law together with students in German 
which was uh, more or less also a translation course, but, but it was also interesting to talk about the, the German history, to think about um, why certain laws were implemented after the World War II, after experiences in the Weimar Republic and so on. Okay. Uh, then I have an office hour every two weeks at the Goethe Institute where I, I'm there to inform people who are interested in study or to do scientific work in Germany. Um, I also give presentations in universities as well as schools for um, promoting um, or to support people who want to study in Germany. Uh, I was um, traveling a lot in Rio Grande do Sul to uh, give these presentations in schools as well. So, they, of course, they have other kind of questions as people with a PhD have. So it's quite a broad um, type of work. Um, then I'm responsible for the application of the onset test of German proficiency. This is a language test um, that is for free and is offered basically two, three times here in Porto Alegre uh, within a year. Basically, I'm doing it quite, quite much more. I think it was five times already this year. Um, I also applied the test in Pelotas, and, and this is a test that it's important, for instance, for people who want to do the winter course, ne, the winter class in Germany, because they need to uh, prove a certain level of German. Um, right now, it will happen probably in November again here in Porto Alegre. Okay, uh, then of course participation in scientific conferences and workshops because my, my academic context is still literature, so I try to uh, work as well in this area, so um, at the URGIS, but also in other uh, conferences all over Brazil. And of course there are also special events which happen regularly, so for example the week of the German language, Die Woche der Deutschen Sprache, which uh, happens every year. Um, and within this, um, within this week, there are several uh, events all over Brazil, as I said, there are events in literature, culture, but also much more simple things like uh, people cook together German food, just to promote a bit the German language and the use of the German language. And another thing is the week of the European language, which will happen this week actually here in Porto Alegre. So there's also a lot to do uh, at the Goethe Institute. There are special events um, which have to do with all European languages. So for instance, we do a, um, a lecture together on the work of Goethe, the uh, trip to Italy. We read the, this kind of book or some parts of the book in German and Italian and Portuguese. Um, and some uh, classes on um, translation as well. Okay, um, I will just finish with some flyers. Um, this was the flyer this year of the week of the German language um, all over Brazil. So it happened in April. I guess it will happen as well next year in April as well. So everybody who's interested can just put it to the agenda. Um, this is one event which will happen this week, uh, Estudana Europa, Study in Europe. So an event which um, includes several European countries, and we will talk about um, the difference, but also the, the shared points um, of the certain um, countries. So here we have a joint cooperation with Bel Belgium, uh, France and Italy. So this will happen this year, at, uh, this week at the PUKI. And this is more personal thing. Um, I will give a workshop on uh, Kafka and the question uh, to who belongs the writer. So this is the question about Kafka and like several countries who want to um, who want to have um, a special national way of of claiming him a writer of Chippo, uh, a writer of German language or a Israel a Jewish writer? No? The Jewish state of Israel claims Kafka to be Jewish, so uh, from Israel. 
And of course, his situation was quite complex. He was born in Prague, so also the Czechs sometimes say, ah, he could also be a Czech writer. And uh, this is a, like a, a workshop in the question of internationalization of, of uh, literature. And it will also happen in October, just to give an overview about uh, things that are happening. Okay, if there are questions, you can ask afterwards, I guess, or right now. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, and um, enjoy the uh, the last uh, the next parts of the program as well. Thank you. Any question? Questions? Uh, well, I've got a question. Yeah, if you know, uh, se quiserem perguntar em português, eu posso traduzir. Fiquem à vontade. Uh, é, é verdade. Sorry. Desculpe. Não sei como se diz desculpe em, em alemão. I don't know how to say sorry in German, I mean. <laughs> um, pergunta em português também. Uh, eu tenho uma questão sobre a dupla diplomação. Um, como que funciona normalmente? Uh, são algumas com, apenas com algumas universidades alemãs ou com qualquer universidade alemã, a dupla diplomação, por exemplo, para PhD students. Um, do you want, want me to answer in Portuguese or English? English, okay. Portuguese. Okay. Uh, então, uh, okay, I will answer in English. Um, um, the, this kind of uh, scholarships, PhD scholarships, they don't depend on universities. So actually, uh, you can do this kind of scholarships in every German university, which is considered a, a recognized university. Also, in um, other kind of universities, which are called uh, Kunsthochschulen, eh? universities which deal with arts. Um, and it works like this. You uh, normally in Germany. It, works a bit differently to do a PhD because here you have to do a test no, to be accepted for a PhD. In Germany it's a bit more simple basically, so you need a project first, uh, you write an, an abstract no, um, for your project, this is what you have to do no, before, and you need, um, um, as we call it, a doctor mutter, a mother, like in, in Portuguese would be orientadora, Orientador, but we call it mother, which doesn't have necessarily have two functions of a mother. I hope not. Um, so these two things that you need. So in this kind of um, uh, person could be from, should be a professor from a German university, of course, but could be from each university German in, uh, in Germany. And with this kind of, you need this kind of contact. You, you write a mail to the orientador or orientador and your project needs, needs to be accepted. And if you have made these two steps, you have a project and you were accepted by a German uh, orientador, orientadora, you can apply for the scholarship of the DRD, okay. basically. And do you need some kind of special agreement between the German university and the Brazilian one? Um, no, actually not. You, you don't need, a, you don't need a, an already existing agreement. Huh? Okay. There was one more, one question. A aplicação, professor, pode ser em inglês ou necessariamente tem que ser uma aplicação em, em alemão para para esse tipo de possibilidade? Obrigado. He asked if the application can be made in English or just in German, maybe. Um, depends on the um, on your paper basically because um, there are several Brazilian students as well who want to do the PhD in English so they can if the orientador orientadora accepted do the PhD in English so it could be also in English but of course no, as I always say it's um, the academic field is not the only field so it's always good to to know some German when you go to Germany but there are people who arrive with little knowledge and also do the PhD uh, in English, and they could apply Tambang with a uh, with a English abstract Tambang as well. Any other question? No. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Robert. Thank you. So, um, just a sec, please. We have now, it's the first time I'm doing this, so I am just getting used to the process. <laughs> uh, we have our first panel now. It's social innovation in Europe. And for it, uh, we'd like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Jürgen Hovold and Dmitry Domanski, both from the TU Dortmund University. Professor Jürgen Hovold will be presenting Social Innovation, Chains and Challenge for Universities and SSH. I'm not sure what it means, sorry. SSH. Okay. And then Dmitry Domanski, Understanding Social Innovation Ecosystems in Search of a Concept. So, please. For yeah. okay, thank you. Don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much uh, that you give me the opportunity to say something about our research in social innovation and I will present only a small part and uh, uh, Dimitri also because we do since many years research on social innovation and if you are interested in the results of our research I would like to make a little advertisement. Uh, you find uh, many things that we have researched in the last year in this atlas of social innovation which bring together the leading experts uh, in this research field and you can download the atlas free of charge from the internet and we just had uh, on Friday published the second volume of the atlas so you find also uh, articles uh, from Claudia there and Carolina there and you can pass it around and also this will be free uh, of charge you can download different articles and then you get a broader impression of what we are doing in the field of social innovation and um, I myself am director of the social research center at the TU Dortmund University and the social research center is one of the oldest uh, uh, social research institute in Germany and because Robert Schade mentioned that the constitution of Germany is just 70 years old our institute is even older than the Federal Republic of Germany and was founded 71 year uh, one year before the constitution so we have a long tradition uh, in Germany uh, and uh, I would like to uh, talk in my talk focus on the topic of uh, the role of uh, universities in social innovation and social sciences and humanities so that is SSH means that is uh, that also uh, uh, as a sociologist I'm always interested uh, to say what could be my specific role what could be the difference to the engineering science mechanical sciences and I think social innovation gives us the opportunity to rethink also our role as social scientists and uh, now I would need this wonderful thing um, what uh, and uh, to say uh, the empirical background uh, for my presentation will be uh, some research project uh, that is uh, on the one hand the as a drive project where we try to give an overview about the different social innovation initiatives and the core was an uh, analysis of uh, 1005 uh, social innovation initiatives on the global scale and uh, on the other hand two uh, projects uh, also founded by the European Union which focus more on uh, the competences of universities to be part of these processes uh, and uh, to start uh, with uh, some theoretical background uh, there is a long tradition of the innovation studies to think about the role of universities in innovation systems be it the national innovation system or the uh, regional innovation system and uh, the colleagues from the innovation studies uh, think that universities play a very important role as source of fundamental knowledge or sometimes also of an industrially relevant knowledge in the modern economy and that is reflected by the concept of the triple helix that means uh, to be successful to build the successful innovation systems you need uh, academia universities on the one end you need the public uh, policy and you need companies to come together and that create then a good innovation system and uh, in recognition of that fact there are a lot of initiatives and program that has been uh, connected and uh, conducted by governments uh, to promote uh, a stronger engagement of universities in technological innovation 
And uh, so one question uh, in our global mapping of the Asset Drive project was, what is the role of universities in social innovation processes? And uh, that is, a, uh, I think, a map that uh, made clear that social innovation has become an ubiquitous concept. You find social innovation initiatives everywhere in the world. Uh, in Latin America, there's a long tradition, I think, also in Brazil. Not the concept, maybe, but it was about social economy, it about social technology, uh, which is similar to the concept of social innovation. And there were a lot of uh, successful initiatives in different parts uh, of Latin America, but also in North America, in Europe, in Australia. You find it everywhere. Everywhere people engaged in social innovation. And uh, the second very important insight of the social innovation project was that social innovation is much more than social entrepreneurship. Even social entrepreneurship plays a very important role, but it's uh, also clear that in the initiatives that we analyzed, uh, companies play a very important role, policy play a, important, a very important role, and especially civil society plays a very important role, and NGOs, NPOs, and so on. And to make really create successful social innovation, you need the interplay between these actors. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, we would say that um, the triple helix model, that is maybe the right model to understand uh, technological innovation, is not the right model to understand social innovation because the crucial role of uh, civil society. So we need something like we would call a quadruple helix, where government, economy, academia, and civil society plays a very important role and work together. Uh, that is something that makes social innovation successful. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we then ask what are the specific function of universities and higher education institutes in these initiatives. And at the first glance, it seemed to be quite similar to uh, the role of universities in technology innovation. You find that they are important in the idea development, uh, also provision of personal, provision of uh, uh, infrastructures, provision of knowledge. This is a basic element that are similar to the technological innovation. But on the other hand, uh, if you take a closer look, uh, we were surprised that in these 1,005 cases, in only 15% universities and higher, uh, higher education institutes were involved. So that would be totally different in the field of technology innovation, where normally there is a university or a research institute partner of the development, and the social innovation is only in a very small part. So if we uh, take a look at this quadruple helix, as, uh, I would say, a very important part of a successful uh, innovation, social innovation system, we can say that there is a strong uh, engagement of government, there's a strong engagement of companies, there's a strong engagement of civil society, but unfortunately, uh, science and research only taking a minor role in that. And that is why we focus also on the role of universities and how can we enhance the role of universities in these processes and in, in social innovation uh, at all. But that uh, was bad news, but there is also a good news and the good news is that in many of the initiatives that we find in Europe and beyond Europe in the last years, we see uh, an increasing importance of universities and uh, specific programs that help to develop these uh, uh, activities that universities do. For example, in Europe there's a large program that is called Science with and for Society where a specific uh, um, perspective is uh, done on the specific role of university in those processes or uh, responsible research for society in universities is a very important program. But also uh, uh, in, in Germany there is a, a large program from the German Ministry of Research and Innovation that is called Innovative Hochschule or Innovative Universities worth 500 million of euros that also tries to promote universities in the field of uh, innovation, technological and social innovation. And there were a lot of projects. I will present uh, two of the projects, Students for Change and also Psyche, which also try to develop specific concepts in the field of social innovation for universities and also networks uh, that uh, bring together researchers like, for example, the European School of Social Innovation, uh, that brings together uh, European universities uh, in the field of social innovation and tries to create also a research field in, in this uh, regard. Um, many of these activities that are connected with uh, social innovation uh, are uh, brought together under the heading of third mission. 
a third mission of university is a very important concept which means basically uh, what universities do in order to stay or become relevant for a society. But uh, what I think is very important, uh, and I would like to emphasize that what Arusena and Sus say, that the three missions of university should be considered as inseparable. So it is not, uh, make not much sense to have a third mission and uh, leave everything in teaching and uh, research at the same, but you have to really develop a comprehensive strategy for university to make them more uh, uh, important for societies. And therefore I would like to go through the three missions of uh, universities in the field of social innovation and maybe mention some of the challenges uh, that uh, we find and also some of the experience that have been made within the last years. So starting with the teaching, uh, it is very important that uh, universities take up the topic. I'm not sure if in Unisinos uh, there is a master or something out there, but there are a lot of uh, initiatives, uh, for example, in, in very uh, well-renowned universities, like in Oxford, for example, there is a side business school focus on social entrepreneurship and social innovation. There is a center for social innovation at Stanford, which also is one of the uh, very established social innovation uh, uh, centers uh, uh, in the world. Uh, also in, in, in Colombia, in Latin America, we find a lot. Unfortunately, I have to say in German, there's only one master of social innovation, management of social innovation. We also include social innovation as part of broader master programs, but it's not the main topic. Uh, and I think that would be also very important to develop those activities in Europe. And that is a very good example that Europe can learn from Latin America a lot in this field of uh, research. There are also programs uh, and projects, for example, the Students for Change project. Dimitri was uh, one of the coordinators of that project. I think it was finished last month in, in Mexico, at the, this month in, in Mexico. And that was the aim of the project was to integrate social innovation and social entrepreneurship in the curricula of higher education institute in Latin America with the aim of using the potential of these institutes to become important actors of the regional innovation system and regional development. And uh, one of the learning of uh, these programs and uh, this project is that it's not only to take up the concept of uh, social innovation and the idea of social innovation, but at the same time that you need new concept of teaching, like uh, service learning. I think there will be a presentation later about service learning here at the Catholic University. Uh, that is something that uh, would help uh, to bring together uh, in the teaching uh, people from the university and the communities and to make also an impact also in the teaching uh, for community. That is something that is very important uh, to need, that we need new uh, teaching concepts with the concept of social innovation. The second mission uh, of university uh, is the research, which is a very important point. And, uh, uh, the president also mentioned that many universities has a challenge to become more excellent, do a lot to, to uh, really uh, uh, make better their research, uh, be internationally, and so on and so on. And that is, I think, a very important challenge. And uh, if we analyze the role of social innovation in this research area, for a long time, I would say, social innovation was neglected. There was a strong focus, especially in Europe, on technological innovation. I think in Brazil it was social technologies, it was called, so it was already the connection between these two. But the concept of social innovation was not so well known, and there were not so many research programs about uh, social innovation. But that had changed in the last years, and there has been a lot of programs in the field of social innovation that uh, has also advanced uh, the concept. And uh, so I would say that the field of social innovation, we are witnessing something like uh, uh, the movement towards an autonomous research field, which had worked a lot on the clarity and theoretical foundation of the concept on the one hand, and uh, social innovation at the same time has become increasingly important for dealing with specific thematic areas like, for example, public sector innovation, social economy, a long tradition. I know that uh, Adriana works in that field, for example, cities and regional development, but also, which I think is very important, digital social innovation and the role of social innovation in the, uh, the digital transformation of our society, which plays a very important role in Europe in the discussion today. And if you would like to know more about this, 
uh, research field. Uh, you can also download this, with, uh, this uh, uh, study from Dimitri Romanski and Christoph Kolerka, uh, exploring with a certain landscape of social innovation, which is, I think, worth to read and to see. And uh, I would say it is somehow astonishing that social innovation for a long time was not so much present at university because there was a long history of social innovation. And uh, if you s take a look at the book of Benoit Godin, uh, who studied the development of the concept of innovation through the centuries, he said that the concept of social innovation is much older than the concept of technological innovation. Already in the 80th and 90th century, there was a broad discussion about social innovation. And therefore, he said the innovation studies or technological innovation is only a small part of a much broader uh, innovation history where social innovation is in the center. And he also said that the concept of social innovation was always connected to the debate about societal transformation, social change. And uh, so far, I would say, if we think about uh, transforming our society or the, to, to cope with the digital transformation, we need to have a strong focus on social innovation. And in the 19th century and 20th century, social innovation was also seen as something, the advent or adoption of a new behavior, a new social practice. That is our definition of social innovation. We say social innovation is uh, the development of new social practices that help it to cope with the great societal challenges. The challenges are different in different countries. And uh, I would say uh, I don't envy you about your challenges in Brazil in the moment. Uh, but also in Europe, there, uh, there is not a very easy situation. And therefore, we really need uh, social innovation to cope with these great societal challenges. And. Uh, as the same is right, as I said, with the teaching, also in the research, we need new concepts. It's not only about uh, taking up a uh, social innovation research agenda, but it's also uh, about uh, try to involve civil society at the beginning, not only to produce knowledge in three years of academic uh, procedures and projects and then try to transfer the knowledge, but to start from the beginning uh, to involve people from, from civil society, from the community, and uh, like uh, approaches like participatory action research, design thinking, there will also be, I think, a presentation later, if I'm right, transition research and design. Uh, these are um, not only new concepts, but I think uh, it helps us to rethink uh, the role of science in uh, our society and to really to promote the power of uh, science and university to bring change. And I think it was very important what uh, the president says, that even if we try to be more excellent, we shouldn't forget that we have also a very important uh, role for society and that we have to develop concepts like this one uh, to really uh, be able to uh, connect our excellent research with societal impact. And that means also to integrate and involve practitioners from the beginning. And that fits very well uh, to one very important feature that we found in our uh, research, in our global mapping, and that is the feature of empowerment. Empowerment was uh, seen by the expert that we uh, had uh, part, as, we, as part of the uh, as a drive project as the most important uh, feature of social innovation initiatives. That means that social innovation is not so much about doing things for people, but doing things for and with people and develop their capacities and uh, also competences uh, to become more relevant in society and to be part of society. And I think, especially in times of right-wing uh, presidents, not only in Brazil, but in the US and also in Germany, in, in, not in Germany, luckily, but also in, in Europe, we have those examples. It's very important that the people feel as part of society and that they have participatory structures and that they empower to be part of these activities. And especially the most vulnerable groups, that is something that we have to keep in mind. And that is also a role of social innovation. And I think that brings me only one remark to, to social sciences and humanities. Uh, I think like Frank Moulin in his report for the European Union says that social sciences and, and uh, humanities, they have been precursors of this interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research for decades. And they are able to create impact that is very important if they try to develop these new efforts and uh, that they are a very important part of different uh, developments in uh, 
different uh, uh, research fields like urban and regional studies and so on and so on. I think that is a very important point to keep in mind and uh, it's very uh, easy to say but it's very uh, difficult to do and to develop this concept. Therefore, I think we need more research how to do that in the right way. And that brings me now to the uh, last point, the third mission, uh, which is normally seen very much uh, uh, to include civil society in research and transfer. Uh, and that is a very important point, I think, that we also have to think how can we uh, transfer our knowledge to society, which is a very important point. And I would say it in a more broader way, it's not only about transfer, it's how to create impact from our research for society. Not only that uh, maybe 10 uh, colleagues uh, from the university read our papers and send us uh, nice comments, but really to make a change in society and as uh, the president says, make a better world. <laughs> I think that is a very important point and uh, that is something that uh, really is, uh, I would say, the most important challenges uh, for society. And it's also very much connected to infrastructures. Uh, in our Asset Drive project, uh, we found that like technological innovation, also successful social innovation, need uh, presuppositions and require appropriate infrastructures and resources that has been developed in the field of uh, technological innovation in Europe for many years. So every city has a technology center, every university has a department for technology transfer. But what is missing is the same infrastructure for social innovation. And it's also so that in many uh, papers of uh, governmental organization, of international organization like the United Nations or the European Union or also the research programs in Germany, they don't uh, focus so much on social innovation. But that is changing now. We have a chance to really a window of opportunity to create also a more uh, impact of uh, social innovation. And uh, therefore, I would say that infrastructure play a very important role. And I think many people here are working on infrastructures. And uh, therefore, in our new atlas of social innovation, we dedicated a whole uh, chapter uh, on uh, infrastructures of social innovation, different labs. Uh, so, for example, Carolina um, had presented the, the observatory in Florianopolis, uh, really a great, great initiative. Uh, and uh, there's also, um, uh, also uh, um, an article from the Inter-American Development uh, Bank. Uh, they had also a social innovation lab and uh, other examples of uh, different activities. So that is something I think is very important and uh, also in the last decades there have been a lot of uh, uh, centers of social innovation developed in different parts of the world, not only in Latin America but also in Australia, in Europe, in, uh, in North America. So we find uh, a lot of initiatives and uh, they have uh, some, some, I would say, uh, uh, similar structures and characteristics. So to provide support for social entrepreneurs and social innovation, help to facilitate the innovation processes, work on the societal challenges, and so on and so on. Uh, but at the same time, there are different types of those centers. Uh, so for example, uh, we have uh, centers that, that work uh, that are, that are supported by public organization. We have centers that uh, are uh, organized by social entrepreneurs by themselves. And we have, uh, last but not least, uh, also centers that uh, had been developed by higher education institutes. Uh, uh, that would be also for us very important. And we are discussing in Dortmund also to have a center for entrepreneurship and transfer, which should try to connect technological innovation with social innovation. And the city of Dortmund uh, uh, is developing a, a center for social innovation from the mun municipality, so that we will in Dortmund have a, a center for social innovation and will work together from community uh, and university. And um, this last type of um, the last type of, uh, of uh, uh, labs was also part of the Lazin project that uh, was uh, conducted by the. Uh, Caledonian uh, University in Glasgow, uh, Mark Anderson and colleagues, they work a lot uh, together with partners here in Latin America to create uh, social innovation support unions in different universities here and uh, that is something that is very important and I think, as I said before, uh, it is something where uh, uh, European uh, uh, countries and universities can learn from these activities. They should uh, 
create creativity, they should organize collaboration with society, they should have an open door policy, and I think also it's very important to have uh, uh, mutual learning processes and also innovative copyright policy, which is also something which is very important uh, uh, to have. And uh, this is an example that also leads some uh, European uh, researchers to uh, try to learn from these examples and try to develop those uh, units also in European universities. That's the project Psyche. Also, uh, Dimitri Romanski is part of that project. It was an Erasmus project uh, that uh, is just on the way to really try to learn from the example of Latin America and create such activities also in European universities. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, with all that in mind, I would say that the great challenge for the contemporary uh, innovation research lies in analyzing the potential of social innovation in the creation of new social practices that enhance an inclusive, equitable, democratic, participative, and above all, socially anchored future. This will allow people to live richer and more fulfilled and prosperous lives. And I think university uh, have a very important role in these processes and uh, they could make really a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yuri. Thank you. Questions? Se quiserem perguntar em português, fiquem à vontade, pessoal. Hi, good morning. É Carolina John from Universidade de Santa Catarina, Florianópolis. Um, you got very, uh, very interesting presentation. I have a lot of questions, but we will discuss. But one one point that I I think is very important is the territory inscription of these experiences. And uh, you told about the city and the involvement of the municipalities with this, these initiatives. I, I like to develop a little bit more about it, it's easy, if, if it, it's possible. Yeah, I think that's a very important point because uh, in our uh, analysis of these cases, we also know that uh, many of the social innovation initiatives are very much connected to the community. So that is a very good point, but the bad point is that uh, sometimes they uh, are not, they don't develop really impact because they were not transferred to other municipalities, there are no learning processes. But the point is that if you really would like to create an ecosystem of social innovation, it's more, more a local ecosystem like you do in Florianopolis, as I understood, that you try to make a network between the people that work in the field and that you try to create cooperation between different sectors and that is something that is very important. And uh, I think that is something that we also try in Dortmund so to, to bring together university, the uh, community and also the different uh, initiatives that are still that are just working without uh, support from from the government but they uh, are really keen to have more support and uh, be happy to, to to have this support also in Dortmund but I think that is very important so I think that would be necessary to have mutual uh, learning processes between the different initiatives because we cannot copy the things that you do in Florianopolis and you can copy that what we do in Dortmund but we can learn from each other and we can say this is a good idea that would also work in, in Dortmund and, and the other way around and therefore I think it's very important to have this uh, also this workshop here uh, to, to think and to, to talk together and to learn together that is something that we have and that is also the idea of the atlas to make uh, special good initiatives uh, uh, also available for other people in other countries that do not know about that. Questions? I think it's better to stand up. Good morning, Professor. My name is Bruno Lesse, and I'm a PhD student at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for your talk, and to, it's very nice to meet you in person. And um, my question is about knowledge transfer, you know, because in the field of technological innovation, knowledge transfer is a rather problematic issue in both theoretical and practical terms, and especially when we take universities into account. But when we go to the 
to the field of social innovation, it, get, it gets a little bit more complex because the knowledge transfer happens the other way around. I mean, in the, in the sense that m most of the time, social innovators transfer knowledge to universities. And uh, so my question is, considering your experience in both European and the Brazilian contexts, so I would like you to, to clarify a little bit what would be the greatest challenges for this knowledge transfer processes from social innovators to universities. And thank you very much, again. I think uh, it's a very important point that you make uh, because we have to admit that uh, the driver of the development of social innovation is not the university and it's also not the social sciences, I have to admit, uh, but it is civil society that creates in society these activities and I think that the biggest challenge is that uh, the research and universities have to learn that they are not the people that create uh, innovation, but they have to give support to the people in society. So our, uh, we, we say that uh, innovation is not, nothing that is only done in companies and universities, but society itself is the innovative. And that means that we have to rethink science, that we have to develop new mode of science where the knowledge from society comes together with the uh, knowledge of uh, the universities in the form of a co-production. So it's not to transfer our knowledge, but to co-product and to help to, to make the knowledge more uh, accessible for other universities and uh, to help the uh, innovators to become more productive. On the other hand, I have also the idea that uh, if we have, we have some freedom. We can travel throughout the world and we can uh, spend a lot of time to write uh, things and to make our presentation. I think many of the social innovators and social entrepreneurs, uh, they don't have the time because they work uh, in societies. And therefore, I think if we use our time to help them and to try to answer their questions, and knowing more, that could be something that is very important uh, to see. I think it is the, the core idea is we have to rethink science. Not science is a driver of this, but it's uh, the driver is society and how can we help society to become more innovative? That would be one very short answer. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I'm not uh, an academic as most of you, but I'm a practitioner. And, uh, I would love to learn more. We are every day trying to really bring inclusive, actable, bringing the voice of low-income communities in everything we try to do. But uh, as you know, Brazil is one of the worst in inequality. We can look in this room. We don't have any black people, probably people coming from low-income communities, but in a different perspective. So can you share with us some of your uh, cases or what you learn about really successful projects that brought the voice of low-income communities, of diversity. Uh, you have a huge uh, immigrant community in Germany and we are increasing these communities in Brazil. So if you can share some of those cases and what was successful in this. I think that is a very important point and I think a very important challenge also in Europe. Uh, also there, uh, I would say it's very difficult to really involve uh, people from low income or uh, other ethnic groups and migrants uh, into these projects. Uh, and I think uh, it is very important to see that it's not the task of one social entrepreneur. So we try, and that was also our focus, try to create something like a social innovative environment. And that is also the role of policy. So I know it's very difficult now in Brazil. And uh, when we had been uh, to Brasilia last uh, year, it seems to be a bit better that also in Brazil there could be a development of a policy. But that is what we do in Europe. For example, uh, I, I would say that uh, the, the increasing inequality you cannot, uh, uh, cannot change with social innovation. It needs, uh, for example, a comprehensive policy of the government, uh, which also includes social policy, which also includes tax policy. 
I would say, is a very important poll. And uh, we tried to uh, convince the German government uh, not only to uh, develop a comprehensive innovation policy, focus on technical and social innovation, which is just uh, in the, uh, I would say, uh, the high-tech strategy, which is a central strategy of German government, already in, and they, now they develop programs. But on the other hand, I think it's also very important that the government sees that social innovation is something that has to uh, affect all the different, uh, uh, different uh, policies. It's not only about innovation policy or research policy or science policy. It's also about social policy. It's about economic policy. It's about tax policy. And it's also in the company. So you need companies that also try to develop a, a kind of management that uh, try to open up participatory uh, spaces for the people, that engage in uh, local activities. So I would say if we really would like to, to make the world a better place, uh, we have to see that uh, it's only possible if every actor in society plays a very important role and try to uh, support these activities. And that is one of the, I would say, major insights. Uh, this ecosystem, the, the, also I cannot go into details, we also see what is the, which actors are involved and what is their specific role. What is the role of uh, higher education institute, what is the role of companies, how can they support? What is the role of policy? And there are different roles, and they have different uh, uh, opportunities to scale and to leverage the experience. That is what I would say. We need really a broad concept of social innovation. Otherwise, you are a repair concept that, that tries to, uh, uh, to do things uh, like if, if you see, for example, uh, uh, if you, the welfare in Germany and in, in Europe have a strong welfare state, and if this, uh, the states say we won't spend not so much money in social policy, now can the social entrepreneur do? I think that's not the right way. We won't make the world a better place by doing so. So we need the coordinated action. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Daniel Braturina from Croatia, and I'm here in short-term scientific mission within one project that is empowering next generation of social entrepreneurship scholars. And uh, from, Cro from Croatian experience, so we participated in, let's say, concurrent but not concurrent projects in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, like Wilco Project and Third Sector Impact Project. And we were one of the lonely researchers that were studying and trying to develop social innovation in Croatian context. So we are doing not only supporting, but also co-creating social innovation because we saw that as mission of our department, mission, mission of the university. For example, next week we have one big conference regarding first service learning project at, at our university. But my question is, we feel relatively lonely. So it's a small department, there's a couple of us, we are doing research, doing support, trying to, to develop the field. But on the other hand, uh, let's say at university level, university is very rigid in administration and very old-fashioned in viewing social sciences and its role in, in society. So from maybe from German experience and from your mapping exercise, maybe you had similar experience in other countries, what are the ways of opening, you know, gates of recognition of social universities in the, uh, social innovations in universities? A very important point, and I uh, say at the beginning, we also feel lonesome somehow <laughs> in our university. But uh, I think that changes. Uh, one uh, very important point was that we were very successful in uh, applying for the European projects. And uh, also our rectorate sees there are many money spent uh, from the European Union to promote social innovation. So they say, okay, it must be something uh, with a topic. Uh, so now uh, we're seen as a very important partners of that and other partners come to us and want to learn how to do that. We are, the, I think, in our uh, university, which is a large university with, uh, I think, 35,000 students, uh, we, we are the most successful uh, international activities. Not the engineers, 
So that is one point I would like to say. Then we also try to create, uh, not to feel so lonely, we create uh, networks in Germany. We work together with partners where we know that they do something in the field. So that means if you would like to try to promote the field of social innovation, it's not only uh, by having good ideas uh, and writing good articles, but it's only a social project to bring on uh, partners and to create a social network, a research network. And uh, maybe one, one recommendation, if you do not want to feel so lonely anymore, join the European School of Social Innovation. We can discuss that later. Uh, and we will have a, a large conference uh, next month in, 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 in Dortmund uh, with yeah. And then there we will also have a general assembly and there are partners from, from uh, large universities that bring together the, the researchers that are interested in the field of social innovation. And that is, uh, I think we are now more than uh, 50 uh, uh, institutions that are part of that. So if you would like to join, we are really happy to welcome you. Yeah, we will talk later. Questions? I think you already mentioned about that, know your answers, but um, I want to listen a little bit more about how to leverage uh, the impact of social innovation, especially uh, meaning transforming the society. Because usually in Brazil, as you know, our experience is most focused in uh, isolated practices inside of communities, and how could you scale uh, the impact of this transformation that uh, occurs inside of one community to others. I just want to listen a little bit more. Yes, um, I think uh, the, the point is also the same like in the research area. You have to create networks. Uh, there were a lot of associations in Germany that have been involved in last year that uh, bring together the social entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurs that bring together the universities. Six, for example, the Global Exchange Network for Social Innovation is a network that tries to do that since many years to create also uh, you know, space and there are networks that you are working in, Celia. So I think that is uh, really something that you have to do, it creates networks. But then two additional remarks because you already know the answer, so maybe two, two more. <laughs> so it, but that depends on the government. Uh, we really try to convince our government uh, uh, to take up the topic uh, because I think a very important leverage uh, and driver of social innovation could be the government. Uh, if they take up, if they spend money for those initiatives, if they create also laws uh, that uh, help us to uh, maybe uh, leverage and scale up some activities that have been uh, well equipped in society. That is one important point, but it's not always that the government do it by our own. And therefore, I think social innovation was always connected with social movements. It was not only social entrepreneurship but it was also social movements. And for example, in climate change, the Fridays for Future, I know, do not know if you know them here, in, but Fridays for Future, which comes from the uh, students from, from the schools, they, they uh, make strike every Friday. Uh, and everyone was, no, you cannot do that, you have to go to learn. But they say, why should I learn? If there is no, uh, no, no, no word more when I'm old. Uh, and they go on the street, and that uh, leads that the government uh, tries to uh, really uh, make new programs in the field of uh, climate change and to, to support them. So I think it's always something that is connected to uh, social the movement and also to power structures. So I think uh, it's not the only thing, but I think we have to connect and think about how to create power to uh, make uh, our uh, social innovation community stronger. Mais questões? Any other question? No. Professor Jürgen, again, thank you very much. Muito obrigado, and I uh, have to apologize that I cannot speak Portuguese. I, I understand a little bit, uh, but uh, I don't want to spoil this uh, workshop by speaking Portuguese. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, really. Professor Dr. Dmitry Romanski, it's your turn now. So feel free to take up the floor. I know when I mentioned it, it's what the, okay. 
Hi, hello everyone. My Portuguese is also very poor, so I will try to speak English. Uh, and uh, oh, okay. I think it was just. Yes? Okay, finally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, the um, about um, the concept or, or possible concept <laughs> because I'm not sure there is one already of uh, social innovation ecosystems. So let's say about the topic of uh, social innovation ecosystems, the importance of developing this research topic and um, suggest you a couple of ideas. Um, so, um, basically just to start uh, the question, why social innovation ecosystems? I think Jürgen has already mentioned many very important things that I don't need to repeat, or I will skip them, or just mention very briefly. Um, also regarding the second point, I think there are some similarities, but I will deepen some of them regarding the results of this huge uh, research project SI Drive that we conducted over four years analyzing social innovation on global scale and uh, then I will uh, try to summarize, summarize some thoughts regarding the development of social innovation as a research concept and finally draw some conclusions and I was told I, that I have much more time than originally planned so I will <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> so we, so uh, because I think lunch is like in an hour and a half, or, and this, yeah, okay, cool. Not just a joke. Uh, so um, when we talk about about social innovations, uh, um, in Dortmund we refer basically to a concept based. Oh, we use a concept based on the definition developed by Jürgen Howald and Michael Schwarz. Uh, more or less 10 years ago, and uh, it refers to social innovation as a new combination or figuration of practices, of social practices, in areas of social action, and they are prompted by certain actors or constellation of actors with the goal of a better coping with needs and problems than is possible by use of existing practices. And when we say better, uh, uh, we have to be very careful because better doesn't mean uh, better for, I mean, it can be better for me or for you, better means better than the existing, than the performance, let's say, the solution, or the, or the performance of the existing solution. It is something that does better than uh, their previous solution. Um, and it's, um, yeah, now, of course, and I think now it's, it's something very similar to Schumpeter's innovation concept that it's not an innovation if just something which is an idea and it's, it is invented and maybe it is even used, but it, is, it needs to be widely accepted uh, in the society. Maybe not in the whole society, but at least at set, certain societal levels. Um, becoming finally uh, institutionalized or established as a new routine. So, um, when I was saying at the beginning why social innovation ecosystems um, what we have found, uh, when, because Jürgen mentioned the global mapping in the project as a drive, which was probably the main part of the research project, but at the beginning there was also a very big theoretical study that we made, trying to analyze different uh, research concepts and theories related to the topic of social innovation. And what we actually uh, found out that uh, the systemic concept or systemic understanding of innovation is not really very much developed in the area of social innovation research. I mean, we're talking now about something that was like five years ago, and I would say this is not something that has changed so much. It has changed, yes, but uh, still, generally, I would say we, we are in this situation that this is, there is not so much systemic understanding of social innovation. Of course, as a drive, did exactly the opposite, or tried to demonstrate that we need a systemic approach to social innovation. But social innovation research is 
originally coming, or let's say if we look at the last two th um, decades, three decades of social innovation research, it is much more coming from more isolated approaches. Uh, often we have unisectoral perspectives uh, on social innovation, actor-centered approaches, which is, for example, very typical for social entrepreneurship research. Um, and uh, social innovation, uh, so, sorry, social entrepreneurship precisely has been, has been uh, uh, the dominant topic in social innovation research uh, f for many years together with uh, social economy. Um, so social innovation research traditionally fails to focus on the interfaces between the different societal sectors. Um, and Jürgen ha has mentioned them all, uh, including precisely social, uh, so sorry, civil society and not also, and not only um, um, the public sector or uh, business sector and uh, academia. So, um, one important result of the Office of Drives global mapping was exactly that there is no dominance sector in social innovation. Jürgen said uh, there is one which is still underdeveloped, this is the academia, which still has a lower or weaker participation in social innovation initiatives according to our global mapping uh, than other sectors, but uh, if we look at uh, the business sector, uh, the public sector, and uh, the civil society, yeah, they are all very strong, very strongly represented in different social innovation initiatives, I would say independently from the country or the continent or world region. And um, um, yeah, here you can just see some examples of the numbers, uh, but maybe we shouldn't go too much now into numbers because you also you can see all that in the, in the first atlas of social innovation on also on SR Drive's website. And on the Atlas, by, by the way, on, on the website of the Atlas, you can also download all the cases. You can look at all the cases that were mapped, which were more than 1,000 cases worldwide. Um, so uh, another po important point, not, that we, or, not only that we have all the sectors represented and three of them strongly represented in social innovation initiatives, worldwide, but also usually you don't have just an initiative with only one sector. You have at least two or even three, sometimes four different uh, sectors or actors from three, four different se uh, societal sectors participating in the development, introduction, diffusion of a social innovation initiative. Uh, as we can see here, 91% of the analyzed cases comprise at least two distinct types of, uh, of partners. Uh, yeah, here's a, I'm not sure you can add, but, uh, examples, let's say it's, it's examples of uh, alliances comprised by different, different partners, or partners from different societal sectors. So, um, uh, when we talk, when we're talking about uh, social innovation, we can say it is certainly about development of new alliances. And it, I think it was one of the most striking things that we found from Mesa Drive, uh, from the global mapping. And uh, it is that also, of course, the different sectors have different roles and functions, and they feed themselves, let's say, they fertilize themselves uh, mutually. Actually, it was just past, now part of discussion when Jürgen were, was, an, um, was answering questions and said, yeah, for example, universities are probably not the biggest drive of social innovation, but it has, other, it has different strengths, the strengths then, and resources that civil society often doesn't have. So this is the issue of complementing. How can we complement uh, it in the, in the smartest way? And I would say probably we are quite far from uh, being really good in that. Although, of course, there are good initiatives, but still probably there is a lot of, a lot of potential lost where actually we could uh, develop a much more optimized way of complementing the strengths of different societal sectors working together on social innovation initiatives. But I think the important point is that we already have some understanding about that. So maybe it's the first step towards in, uh, an improvement in this direction. 
uh, when we're trying to understand what, what the social innovation ecosystems, um, I think it's still quite difficult because actually it has like also like maybe four or five years ago it has become a buzzword and I think it is, still it is. At, at the same time it's very difficult to, to find um, extensive academic uh, body of literature, um, academic understanding of what social innovation ecosystems are, which doesn't mean there are no intents. There are, there are several, uh, just some examples here, uh, and uh, you can find more. But, um, of course, it needs much more research. So there are some attempts to analyze or to understand uh, what social innovation ecosystems are. Um, and as you can see here, there are different approaches. For example, Sgarali, uh, an uh, Italian uh, author, he focused very much on the bottom-up movements and uh, I think what some, something that I find uh, found very important uh, is that he's uh, talking about re replacement of existing governance models with, op with uh, ones that are more open, inclusive and participatory. Um, um, we, when we wrote uh, something about social innovation ecosystems uh, f for the first atlas of social innovation, we focused more on ecosystems in terms of environments uh, in which social innovations emerge uh, and um, claiming that they consist of actors, relation between the actors, uh, governance models precisely, but also supportive infrastructure, something that has already been mentioned here as a very important and still quite underrated point, although, of course, there are more infrastructures now, but also legal norms, cultural norms. Um, and then there is another way of understanding ecosystems more in terms of networks uh, uh, that uh, foster interactions among different entities. So, um, to just to briefly summarize this part, um, to develop a scientific concept of social innovation ecosystems, uh, it would, in my opinion, it would require um, two important things, um, which haven't been done so much so far. On the on the one hand, social innovation research needs to connect more, to connect stronger, and more more focused, more explicitly, to concepts which have been developed, uh, well, it's more my perspective, but uh, I would say there is a lot to learn and I will try to demonstrate a little bit. The area of innovation studies, because we're talking about innovation, but social innovation has become a sort of independent research area, but then there is a well-established research area for more than 50 years of innovation studies. And innovation studies has a lot of merit in understanding the, systemic, the systemic character of innovation. But on the other hand, there are, as I was trying to demonstrate a little bit, there are important findings in social innovation research which go beyond, uh, let's say, it, the, state, the typical state-of-the-art innovation studies and that would also enrich the debate and make it more complete. Um, social innovation ecosystems, if we look at different definitions, they are mainly understood as a territorial innovation concept in terms of local social innovation ecosystems or regional social innovation ecosystems or national social innovation ecosystems but uh, I don't want to say they're not they are not other approaches there are also other approaches uh, which uh, come more from uh, from economy from business economy for example and when it's more about well which, which are more directly connected to the typical uh, innovation ecosystem concept but not social innovation ecosystem concept which probably also bears a lot of potential but which is, which is less my area, let's say. Um, and of course, there, is, there are also interesting, some interesting work from the area of design. I think also here at Unicinos, where your colleagues also look at the area of, uh, oh, sorry, of the, at the topic of social innovation ecosystems from the design and design thinking perspective, which is also a very valuable, very interesting approach. So now more focusing on the perspective of innovation studies and just taking as examples uh, some of the most uh, dominant, most well-known concepts such as innovation studies, sorry, innovation systems, the learning region, 
innovative milieus, uh, industrial districts on triple helix, you can uh, easily see that all of them have done a lot of work over decades, uh, have become classics, as you can see, we're talking about uh, books that were published 20, 30 years ago, uh, some of them, and uh, they would help, for example, uh, innovation systems to, uh, to overcome some limitations that social innovation research has presented so far. Uh, um, just maybe we don't need to deepen everything, but uh, or to go very much into detail. But uh, for example, in social innovation research, knowledge is still not a really a very important topic. We know from ESSA Drive that knowledge gaps is one of the biggest barriers for social innovation innovators to develop social innovations, and if you look at the area of innovation studies, this is one of the most obvious, m m most important topics, knowledge. Today we also already, already have talked about knowledge transfer, and uh, so it is coming, but still it is a relatively small topic, not so much studied, that uh, would uh, really merit much more study and analysis, um, how knowledge is created, developed, uh, diffused, shared uh, in uh, social innovation. Social innovation also needs to overcome a linear understanding of, oh, sorry, social innovation research needs to overcome the linear understanding of social innovation, which um, is maybe a little strange because we would say, well, linear understanding of innovation is something we have overcome 30 years ago, but uh, even when we were in Rome, and we listened to the presentation of Charles Edquist. He also demonstrated that actual linear understanding of innovation still is not overcome, even not in innovation research. So it's, uh, it was very strongly introduced uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. But actually, it's not like everything now understood in a systemic way. Of course, innovation studies are much more advanced than this. And that's, this is also where we have to learn from their work. Uh, OK. Um, University, the, the role of universities was already mentioned, uh, so I don't uh, need uh, to repeat it because it was the main uh, topic of Jürgen's presentation. Um, but as I was saying, at the same time, uh, these and other concepts, well-established concepts uh, from the innovation studies, uh, have also certain limitations um, if we want to to use them, to learn from them, to rely on them, when trying to develop a concept of social innovation ecosystems. Um, first of all, I think we really have to acknowledge that uh, most of them focus on technological innovations and not on social innovation, or social innovations as I was mentioning them at the beginning, social innovations and the student as new social practices. Implicitly they do, Although, yes, mostly it's this, it is about development of technological innovations. And then if it is about social